super psyched to have you here. Uh, this is actually our 13th session. So I'm um, pretty stoked about that as well. And it's an important topic, cervical deformity um, and the surgical decision-making algorithm that, that Ben has developed over his time. Um, and if it's okay, Greg, I'll do the, the introduction just because I've got to know Vanu uh, a little bit recently, yeah, but a young person in our field who is pretty quickly established himself as, as an expert and who I've had the chance to listen to a few times um, as, you know, excellent pedigree, as you can see, if you look him up online, uh, but also a very thoughtful person. And from knowing a few of his co-residents, somebody who's been obsessed with spine surgery from a pretty early stage in his career. So um, a uh, really thoughtful person, somebody we tried to unsuccessfully recruit to San Diego, but uh, somebody we were really psyched to, to hear from. And before I turn it over to you, I just want to quickly plug the Bridging the Gap Conference, which will be this summer uh, here in Carlsbad, just north of San Diego, which is sort of the official meeting of the West Coast Fellows. And there will probably be some funding opportunities that we'll uh, elaborate on for fellows um, at, a, at a later date. So I'm going to stop sharing a venue and turn it over to you, man. All right, let me share. Uh, all right, back here. All right, can you guys see my screen okay? Yeah. All right, perfect. So, um, Hanny, thanks, th th thanks so much for the introduction. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm really honored to, to be able to talk to you guys this morning and uh, for you guys to consider uh, me for this this conference. And this has been really great. I think this is uh, awesome for the fellows. Uh, we are now basically at the halfway point of uh, a fellowship year. And so um, I think this is a problem that, uh, that you know, is, is really common. Uh, uh, Everyone is going to see this in their in their practices uh, once you graduate. And so this talk is not really focusing on surgical techniques per se, but I kind of want to give the fellows more of a framework of how to think about these patients, um, because I think that uh, these, these problems, although you see them commonly, I think the the times that we operate on severe cervical deformities is just less common than we than than TL deformity. And so um so today we're really going to focus on decision making principles. I'm going to try to keep this to about 20, 25 minutes so we have some time for questions at the end. So so um <clears throat> So as I alluded to, I think that although we see these conditions very frequently, um, the definition of what is a true cervical deformity is something that I think is not yet clearly defined. Um, and so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what sort of associated conditions that we have to think about when we're treating patients with cervical deformity, um, what measurements are important, and what are alignment goals when we're trying to treat these patients. Um, and like I said, I, I really want you to come away with a frame work for thinking about this patient population. Um, as far as the techniques, like I said, we're not going to spend too much time talking about this. Um, and the reason uh, is, and the reason for that is most of you guys now, uh, guys and gals now, six months into fellowship have seen and probably done most of these procedures with the exception of maybe, you know, the, the, the osteotomy is like a three column osteotomy or, or uh, even probably less commonly formed is an anterior osteotomy with a, a complete unstenotectomy. Um, but, but the, the top four techniques are certainly things that are the workhorse of treating most deformities, including cervical deformity and, uh, or sorry, treating cervical deformity. And, and you've all seen this and done this and, and it's not a matter of, you know, can I do this procedure or can I treat the cervical deformity? In most cases, it's usually do I, what procedure do I do? Um, and so, so that's where we're going to actually focus more of our time today. Um, if we think about a general framework for how we work up and treat a cervical deformity patient, it's really no different than a thoracolumbar deformity, right? So we identify the location and the type of deformity, and we'll talk more about this, but in the, in for cervical deformities, it encompasses these four categories. Um, we assess the flexibility of the deformity and we have, you know, supine imaging, traction views, looking for open discs or fused discs, looking for open facets or, or, or fused facets. And then once we, once we do that, you know, we're planning our upper instrument vertebra, lower instrument vertebra, whether it's a single or dual approach, whether we're staging the procedure and what releases are going to be necessary to correct the deformity. And we have great planning tools and things to, to, to do that. But again, this is really the same for 
a thoracolumbar deformity. Um, so what makes cervical deformity unique? I think that what makes this unique and different is that it's frequently associated with spinal cord compression and cervical myelopathy, which tends to lend an urgency to these procedures that is not the case uh, for thoracolumbar deformity. Um, we just had uh, you know, a, a dinner last night, we were talking about that Steve Lewis's um, uh, you know, waiting time for a, for, a, for a deformity operation in Canada is like 18 months now. You know? And so uh, often these patients show up and they're acutely myelopathic or, or have worsening myelopathy. And that's the reason why they present to you. And so you can't wait 18 months to operate on these patients. Um, it's really the neurologic symptoms that are often the main driver of disability in this, in this patient population. I think also different than yeah. lumbar deformity is that um, they yeah. often have very severe underlying medical comorbidities, and these patients can be quite frail, uh, even more so than the, the, the TL deformity population, and this uh, definitely plays into the decision-making. And I think the complication rate is higher in the, in these patients, you know, um, once you start to do, especially the severe deformities, um, there's a higher complication rate and there's often less predictable outcomes, um, uh, because of the underlying comorbid, comorbid status of these patients. And so these are all things to consider when treating cervical deformity patients. So how do we define and evaluate cervical alignment? I would say that this is not so simple. If we look at the thoracolumbar deformity population, I feel like over the last 10 years, we've gotten pretty darn good at understanding how spinal pelvic alignment, uh, uh, you know, is ties into, to, to how a patient stands and, and we have, you know, PI minus LL, we have L1 PA, we have, you know, Roosley classification. We have all these different means in which to think about the alignment of uh, the thoracolumbar spine. Yet in the cervical spine, um, I think that we are still stuck in this phase where everyone thinks that this is the shape of a cervical spine. And, and we know that that's just not true. Um, so this is a paper published back in 1997, which, uh, you know, showed that, uh, you know, that basically define the segmental lordosis, you know, uh, throughout the cervical spine and a bunch of asymptomatic volunteers without neck pain. Um, and it shows that, and which is still true, that that the mo most of the cervical lordosis is at uh, between the oxput and C2. But if we look, um, all of us who treat cervical patients know that there that is not the shape of uh, of a cervical spine for everyone that comes in, right? And so, so in this study that was published a couple of years ago, um, uh, fully a third of patients had this kyphotic curve um, uh, appearance to their neck with an average kyphosis of nine degrees. And so if this is a third of all of our patients that are asymptomatic, then we can definitively say that not, not all kyphosis can be pathologic, right? And so, uh, and, and if we think that deformity surgery is trying to restore normal anatomy, it makes it a little bit more challenging to try to understand, um, you know, which shape of cervical spine are we actually trying to reproduce when someone has a pathology that is that is um, uh, making it difficult to, to, to ascertain what the normal alignment of that spine should be. I think the other thing that also makes it difficult from the cervical spine is that the TL alignment strongly influence the cervical alignment, right? And so the, the cervical spine is really the top of the flagpole. And so any changes that happen in the lumbar spine or the thoracic spine are significantly going to uh, uh, change the, the cervical alignment because it is one way that the spine compensates for a problem in the thoracic or the lumbar spine. And, and so if we look at, you know, the commonly, um, uh, the, the, the published cervical deformity measurements that I think uh, a lot of us look at to how to assess a cervical deformity patients and also what our goals are for, for realigning someone. Uh, the, the, the published criteria in many of the studies are C2 to C7 kyphosis greater than 10 degrees. Uh, we're going to skip over briefly coronal cob because obviously cervical scoliosis is, is a much more rare phenomenon. Usually we're talking about sagittal plane deformities. Chin brow vertical angle greater than 25 degrees or a C2, C7, SVA of greater than four centimeters. So we already said that the that kyphosis can be normal, right? And so this can be present in asymptomatic, completely normal individuals. And then these last two, the chin brow vertical angle and SVA can be entirely caused by a thoracolumbar deformity, right? So you have to be really careful in terms of evaluating these patients. And, and one thing I would tell all of the fellows is that if you are 
even thinking about doing any sort of deformity operation, whether it's the lumbar spine, whether it's the cervical spine, I would always get full length spine x-rays in the evaluation of, 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 you know, not only cervical deformity patients, but all deformity patients, because, um, you'd be, you'd be, I think all of us know how often our plan changes, you know, if you get a lumbar x-ray and then you get a scoliosis x-ray, how often we're doing something different. And the same thing is true of the cervical spine. Um, and you really want to make sure that you're not missing a deformity somewhere else. The next thing I want you guys to, to, to think about is the, you know, these, these two patients, would you classify these as a cervical deformity patient, right? So these are, well, the patient on the left is actually an x-ray I took from a paper on cervical deformity. Um, and the one x-ray on the right is a patient of my own presented with unilateral right arm pain, no neck pain, no difficulty holding her head upright. Right. So if you look at, if you make those x ray measurements that I stated before, both of these technically are cervical deformity patients. Right. So um, they both have kyphosis greater than 10 degrees. Um, but I would tell you that, that you will see this, these kinds of patients more often than you'll see the patients with severe cervical deformities. And, and what you need to think about is when does a patient actually need a deformity operation? even if the radiographs tell you that there's a deformity and when do they just need an operation to treat the myelopathy or radiculopathy? I think one of the problems with, with so much, um, so many measurements that we have these days is that uh, as soon as you see a, a, a measurement that is out of our accepted parameters, uh, the, the immediate thing is to is that we have to fix all the parameters right now. And so you often end up doing a bigger operation than what is actually needed for the patient. And that's really my view is that's not the right way to think about these, these patients in particular. Um, the other thing is that our, our outcome scores for cervical deformity patients really are, you know, we have, we have NDI and we have NRS, you know, arm and, 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 um, uh, and neck. And then we also have myelopathy scores. And when we see improvements in, in the, in the proms, uh, you know, you have to think about whether the, that improvement in the scores is related to the improvement in the neurologic symptoms, which are closely tied into almost all cervical deformity patients versus an improvement in the deformity. Itself. And so, um, there are some scores that are coming out that may be better for cervical deformity, uh, patients, but I think, uh, we're still in the infancy of this. We looked at this recently, um, where we did a poll of the uh, um, of uh, various members of the Cervical Spine Research Society, including several past presidents, several members of CSRS Europe and Asia, and we asked the question, um, and we polled, you know, uh, basically an international group uh, of when would you do a bigger operation, or when would you do a cervical deformity operation in someone who presented primarily with radiculopathy and myelopathy? if they had a lot of these radiographic mal, uh, radiographic parameters that would put them into the cervical deformity category. And amazingly, there is really poor consensus overall across a wide variety of experts, um, uh, both uh, in the United States and OUS, uh, on which patients need a deformity operation. So if you look at this category in particular, a patient with cervical myelopathy and neck pain who had the above radiographic abnormalities, you know, which puts them into a deformity category, uh, only 54% said that they would do a deformity operation more than what would be necessary to treat the, the myelopathy. Um, when you included difficulty holding their head upright, that number jumped to 93%. And so what, um, uh, what I would say is that a patient needs a realignment operation or a true deformity operation, something that's more than what you uh, typically do to treat the neurologic symptoms when they have clinical signs and symptoms of deformity in addition to the radiographic deformity. And so this is, you know, having a visible deformity that you can, you can see, um, uh, neck pain that's at least partially relieved when supine, because this is, you know, removing gravity from the equation. These patients often get, uh, get, get, get better. Uh, or the or the history of you know I have difficulty holding my head upright or I need to use my hand to support my chin to be able to look forward and so I think the, the, these, these things in addition to um, uh, in addition to the radiographic findings uh, are, are when you'd consider a realignment operation. However, the caveat with that is is that if you are only going to be treating the radiculopathy or myelopathy at minimum, your operation needs to not worsen their segmental alignment at the levels being treated. What you don't want to do is worsen the issue because you've decided not to do a deformity operation and, and then have a, have a bigger issue and, or create a, uh, create a situation where someone is, um, 
uh, is unable to um, uh, hold their head up or have their have so um, so uh, in terms of what measurements are important and what our realignment goals are, I think that, um, you know, going back to the AIMS classification, which I think is certainly the best classification system that we have for cervical deformity. Again, you can see all of these, these measurements um, uh, that, that we've talked about. Uh, I think identifying the apex of the deformity is, is really, really key in how you treat these patients, because that really does drive um, drive the understanding of the deformity and how you're going to fix it. And so, so, uh, you know, these patients can have the most common ones are either a, an apex within the subaxial cervical spine itself, um, or the cervical thoracic junction, or actually an apex in the thoracic spine. Uh, coronal deformities are relatively rare in the cervical spine, uh, and craniovertebral junction deformities are also, uh, uh somewhat more rare. Um, uh, certainly, uh, you, you'll see those if you have a big cervical practice, but I think the top three are the most common ones that, that, that many of us see. Um, I think the important thing to remember about this classification is that this was developed um, as a framework uh, because it was these numbers were correlated with disability scores. What has happened is that people are using these as realignment targets, which is not necessarily correct. And so I think it's important to just keep that in mind that these were not originally meant to be realignment targets for getting C2 to C7 SVA less than four centimeters um, or, or uh, uh, you know, achieving, you know, a chin brow vertical angle. I think that these are, are guidelines, but not necessarily uh, strict targets. And I think that there's more work that needs to be done to, to, um, uh, to, to nail these down. So in general, you know, the way that I like to think about how to assess these patients, uh, we've already talked about getting a full length spine x-ray. And I think what that does is starts to tell you a little bit about what the normal shape of that person's spine should be, right? And so, um, and this starts with understanding, uh, you know, what the pelvic incidence is. Is this a high PI patient or a low PI patient? Uh, if someone has a high pelvic incidence, that, you know, is a if you think of a roostly three, three or four type pattern, um, uh, pattern spine, this patient is generally going to have a large lumbar lordosis, uh, a bigger thoracic kyphosis. And, and, uh, because of that, they're going to have a higher T1 slope and, uh, and, and by necessity, they will require a higher or a larger cervical lordosis to maintain horizontal gaze. Um, uh, on the other hand, you know, if you have a patient with a small PI, the, the Rusli one and two type patients, in general, these patients have a lower T1 slope and don't need as much cervical lordosis or may even uh, have uh, slight cervical kyphosis um, and, and be able to maintain horizontal gaze uh, even with that. So, um, if the slope T1 slope is 30 uh, greater than 30 degrees, uh, what that tells you is that uh, if you have a patient with neck pain and you think they have a cervical deformity, that deformity is almost certainly lower than the, the cervical spine. And so you just need to go find it. Um, just as a case example, so this is a patient that uh, uh, was sent to me who had had a prior in situ uh, fusion for Schurman's kyphosis. And uh, while she did not have neck pain before surgery, after surgery, she had severe uh, neck pain in in addition to back pain and, and, and her, one of her main complaints is that she couldn't actually pick her head up uh, and hold her head upright. Um, so when you get, if you just ignore the scoliosis x-ray for a second, you can see that she's got an elevated C2 to C7 SVA. She's got compensatory hyperextension uh, with, uh, she's fully maximizing her, her lordosis from the occiput to C2. And she's got an elevated T1 slope, right? And if we look at the scoliosis x-ray, uh, her deformity, uh, even though she has severe neck pain and all of these uh, 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 you know, abnormal parameters in the cervical spine, her deformity is in the, in the mid thoracic spine, right? So, so I did a vertebral column resection at T9 and, and you can see the overall change in her alignment. Um, and, and if we focus in on the cervical spine itself, you can see that her C2 to C7 SVA is improved her, she has relaxed the segments from the occiput to C2 and her T1 slope is decreased. So, so, uh, and, and she had hundred percent resolution of her neck pain after surgery, which is one of her main complaints. Um, so I think the, the you, again, going back and looking, you want to make sure that you understand where the deformity is coming from when you treat these patients, even if they have a primary issue of neck pain. Um, we're going to get into what I kind of think of as my, my keys for when I'm fixing these patients. But um, the to me, understanding where C2 is, is really important. And getting C2 in a good position um, 
I feel is is is, is critical in, in in treating these cervical patients. So I think of C two as the lighthouse of the of the cervical spine, um, and and I like to get the the peg of the odontoid facing as upright as possible. That's kind of my very easy. I'm, you know, I'm a dumb orthopedic surgeon, so I need something simple to be able to, uh, uh, <laughs> to, to go by. And so for me, I try to get C2 pointing upright. Um, C2 tilt is a pretty good measure of global alignment. Um, you know, C2 is generally well aligned with the hips. Um, C2 slope um, is actually a measurement that I find better than T1 slope, um, uh, or sorry, be better than uh, uh, um, uh, T1 slope minus cervical lordosis. And the reason is that C2 slope is basically an approximation of that measurement. Often it's hard to see uh, uh, T1 slope and um, and because of that, it's hard to calculate that number. But if you think about it, T1 slope and C7 slope are usually about the same. And so, uh, you know, if you take T1 slope minus uh, uh, cervical lordosis, that basically gives you C2 slope. And so uh, this for me is a very good measurement of just trying to get the peg of C2 pointing upright. Um, and, and generally um, that, that's a, a good target for alignment. So um, what I try to do on these on these patients, you know, without uh, looking at strict numbers is I try to get patients to have a neutral lordotic cervical spine with a relatively low C2 slope, like I said, getting the peg of C2 pointing upwards, uh, generally a low C2 to C7 SVA so that the cervical extensors are not having to work hard to hold the, the head up, right? You want to make sure that the unfused segments are in a relaxed alignment. And, and a lot of the compensation in the cervical spine happens between the occiput and C2, like we talked about, but also that uh, that, that someone is not compensating through their thoracolumbar um, uh, segments. People can hyperlordose their lumbar spine to deal with the primary cervical deformity. And so you want to make sure when you're fixing something to, to, to try to fuse the spine in a position where the unfused segments are going to be uh, relaxed. And obviously, uh, it goes without saying that you need to do a, a thorough decompression of the nerve roots and spinal cord to treat the ridiculous and myelopathy. Um, I want to end with a, a, a case presentation. And this is one where I asked probably five or six different people about, about this patient before I did it. And I got uh, every single answer was completely different. And so I ended up going with my own answer and not listening to anyone else. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see uh, you know, uh, what people think. But I think that with these patients, there's often not one way to, to treat them. Um, but obeying these general principles, I think, is a, is, is, um, a good idea. So this is a 58-year-old uh, rheumatoid with uh, a pretty progressive myelopathy. She was actually wheelchair-bound by the time that I saw her. Uh, she presented to me. She actually was sent to me by one of my hand surgery partners because of elbow pain, and she has a, a Charcot elbow, you know, with essentially all the bones eroded uh, and no elbow left. She had neck pain and difficulty holding her head up um, uh, in addition, as well as a T-score of minus 3.1. You can see her alignment. She's got a fairly severe thoracolumbar deformity, uh, what I like to call ghost bone, where you can barely see the bones on the x-ray, um, and almost 90 degrees of subaxial cervical kyphosis with a, a, a C2 slope approaching uh, 90 degrees. So uh, if you look at uh, her imaging, uh, you can see in the center image, it's never good when you can see uh, two, um, uh, ax two images of the spinal cord in the same axial cut. Um, so she had very severe cervical kyphosis um, with, with severe spinal cord compression here at the C23 and C34 segments, uh, an auto-fused C45 segment in kyphosis, uh, and then multi-level degenerative disease. She had, uh, you know, sequelae of her osteoporosis with a compression fracture down here. Um, she had vascular anomalies. Uh, this is actually her uh, internal carotid uh, looped on itself right at the apex of this deformity. And so then you can see on the CT scan, her lying supine and the MRI, she's pretty, pretty stiff, uh, rigid deformity. Uh, considerations that, uh, you know, in, in treating this patient, this patient had pre-existing severe dysphagia. Um, uh, she had contracted soft tissue. This is uh, me in clinic having her extend her neck as much as possible. And you can see the, the stretched skin um, uh, just uh, when she just looks up. Very, very poor bone quality. And, and she's very frail. Um, so again, thinking about these patients, you know, you might <clears throat> the location of the deformity. This is a subaxial cervical deformity. Um, in terms of flexibility, she's completely fused both anteriorly and posteriorly through the facets at C4-5. She's very stiff uh, from C2 to C4. Um, and she had severe stenosis with myelopathy as well as spondylolisthesis at C2-3 with cord signal change uh, with the worst stenosis at C2-3. Um, so I, uh, like I said, I, I wasn't quite sure what to do with her. So, um, I put her in traction and I admitted her to the hospital. Uh, and so I had her in traction for a few days and, uh, you know, I did see that the, I could get this to move a little bit. I got a little bit of a reduction of, uh, her, 
her um, upper cervical segment, C4-5 obviously wasn't moving, but I was able to pull C3 back a little bit and pull C2 back a little bit just with some traction. Um, I had originally planned on uh, doing a, a back front back on, on this patient, um, uh, going in the back, releasing the facets, uh, then going in the front, doing an anterior osteotomy and corpectomy uh, between C4 and C5, um, and then going back to the back. Um, but uh, in this very frail patient, um, I actually elected not to do that. And one of the reasons was that if you look at where her spinal cord compression is, um, it's in a lordotic section of the spine, right? So from C2 to C4, she's actually reasonably lordotic, where the kyphosis is at C, C4, 5. And so um, uh, because she, the fused section of her spine, her spinal cord was not seeing any, any you know, pathologic motion, what I elected to do was uh, an all posterior reconstruction um, with uh, posterior column osteotomies through the upper cervical segments, um, and then uh, long bicortical C1 screws and long bicortical C2 screws, as well as fixation to the skull, uh, as well as a, a you know three fix a third fixation point in C2 with an intralaminar screw there and intralaminar screw in T1 uh, and cemented vertebral plasties below. And so this was. Um, uh, fairly easy surgery for her to recover from. Uh, you know, you can see that I got the C2 slope corrected by about 65 degrees compared to where she was preoperatively. Um, and she um, is now about a year post-op and, uh, you know, she's very, very happy. She's actually back to walking again and using a cane only and, and she's doing quite well. And, um, uh, hope, hopefully this won't fall apart. We'll see. Time will tell. So take home points. I think treating these patients are really, is really challenging. There's a really high complication rate. Um, it's really important, I think, to tailor the plan to the symptoms. Not every patient needs a deformity procedure. Sometimes they just need the radiculopathy or myelopathy treated. Uh, and you don't need to uh, go for a home run correction of every radiographic parameter. Just uh, obey the principles of getting the head over the rest of the torso, getting C2 upright, um, and, and, and fusing the spine in a position where the rest of the spine can be relaxed and without compensatory mechanisms. So thank you. Um, love to hear any questions, uh, comments, um, and you can always contact me if, uh, any questions afterwards as well. Awesome day news. Um, I mean, obviously a super challenging case. I think the cool thing that that exemplifies is how much creativity goes into tackling these really complex cervical deformities. And there's not a cookie cutter and a, algorithm to try to treat them it gets really really complicated and you have to kind of come up with your own plans like you said so if the fellows have any questions i'd like to open the floor to you guys first um here's your chance one not any well, one, one, one comment I'll make, you know, while we're waiting for fellows to, uh, to, to, to think of some good questions, um, uh, is, uh, you know, that, that you really want to treating the neurologic issue is paramount, right? You got to, in these patients almost always have a neurologic issue and it's usually myelopathy in the severe patients. So, so you can't sacrifice treating the myelopathy and having a good spinal cord decompression. Um, I will say that a lot of times it's the motion and, um, mobility of the spine that, that, that causes the problem, especially in the, in a deformity setting. And so, um, uh, don't do a, a laminectomy alone in a patient with, you know, uh, a lot of motion or bad kyphosis. Don't do a, a laminoplasty in someone with, with severe kyphosis, right? So uh, often the immobilization of the spine through a long instrumented fusion um, for a patient with a true deformity uh, is, is, is key and will, um, uh, will, will help with spinal cord recovery. I have a quick question if, if nobody else does. Um, obviously, three column osteotomies, particularly close to the, the CT junction, are fraught with a lot of morbidity. And I know that a lot of folks that sort of got into cervical deformity early on had a lot of problem with that, particularly given the, the importance of those cervical and early thoracic nerve roots. So can you just talk a little bit about that? I mean, are you getting away from three column osteotomies down there, or do you just kind of go in there with neural monitoring and, and some contingency plans and hope for the best or how, how have you kind of dealt with that specific challenge to cervical deformity? Yeah, I think, I think a, a lot of people have gotten <clears throat> away from doing C7 PSOs and even, and even T1 PSOs or T1 VCRs, uh, just because then you're dealing with the, the, the nerves that control intrinsic hand function. Right. And so I think as time has gone on, our osteotomies have gone lower to, to T2 or even T3 
you know, on, on, on some of these patients. Um, I think the lower you go, then uh, you're also going to have to go lower with your distal fixation, you know? And so if you're doing a T3 osteotomy, uh, uh, you know, then you're probably going to have to cross the, the apex of the thoracic kyphosis. So your construct might be longer, you know, but, but I certainly agree with, you know, I, I tend to want to lower my osteotomy. I think a lot of times we're doing those for patients who have proximal junctional kyphosis over the top of a thoracal lumbar fusion, you know, um, uh, or it's, um, it's, it's a, it's a deformity caused by either a fracture or, or something else, you know, in the, in, in the spine. Um, so yeah, I have tried to stay lower in terms of the, the osteotomies just to avoid the issues with hand function. Sometimes you're stuck. I mean, uh, if the, you want to do the osteotomy where the apex is generally, but, um, if the, if, if you can go between, you know, choose between T1 and T2, I would tend to choose T2. Uh, I think you're going to have a little bit lower issue. Now, um, uh, you can, even with a T2 or T3 osteotomy, you can still see hand issues. So it's not guaranteed even uh, with an osteotomy that low when you're technically below um, uh, the T1 nerve root, which we think of as the last one in the brachial plexus, you can still see uh, hand issues. Um, and that's because you can get what's either, you know, people can have a post-fix or pre-fix brachial plexus. Uh, and what that means is that instead of their plexus being from C4 to T1, it's actually C5 to T2, you know, or vice versa. And so that's a, that, that's certainly common. And so um, uh, you still have to be aware of those and do a good, good decompression. Hey, Vinu, a quick question. If you uh, uh, still have any time, uh, Andrew Vivas here, great, great Andrew. talk, man. Uh, really, really fantastic talk. When, when you're fusing someone to the occiput here, what, what are you doing intraoperatively to make sure that the CBVA is appropriate, uh, to make sure that the neck is in a good alignment? Uh, I, I find that to be sometimes, uh, sometimes the, one of the more challenging parts of the case is just making sure that the head's where you want it before you lock in that occipital uh, plate. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a great question. So, you know, I learned uh, as you did, you know, to do a lot of these cervical deformity case, cases uh, using bivector traction, um, which I still like to do, you know, especially for subaxial deformity where uh, I'm going up to C2 or C1 as my upper instrumented vertebra. I find that using bivector traction going to the skull can often be a little problematic because often one of our last maneuvers is to grab the tongs, pull up as much as you can to generate lordosis before you lock everything in. But um, I, I think one of the complications you can have is then you, st you, you put the patient in, in too much hyperextension between the occiput and C2, and then uh, that patient can't swallow anymore. Uh, and for any of you, you know, who, who haven't experienced this, look up towards the ceiling and try to swallow and see how difficult it is. You know, you can really mess someone up if you fuse them in too much hyperextension. So um, uh, what I've done, I usually use a, a Mayfield in those. And, and if, for those of you that have an adjustable Mayfield, um, you know, that can be really helpful. And so at the beginning of the case, I will position the patient and, and kind of look at them on the table and make sure that it looks like in relation to their torso, that they have good horizontal gaze. I'll also um, have this, the upright x-ray um, uh, in the, in the room. And when, on these patients, if I'm going to the skull, I actually have them go get a, a, a new x-ray and tell them to stand in a position of comfort and in a position when they can swallow easily, um, and to try to hold that position. And I get an x-ray and I'll try to reproduce that sort of position in terms of the, uh, skull to C2 alignment. And you can use the hard palate is usually something you can see, um, <clears throat> So McGregor's line is a line that you can usually easily draw in the OR, which is uh, from the epistheon to the back of the hard palate. Um, and you can use that in relation to C2. Um, and, and I'll try to make that in the OR on the floor shots equal to what I have on a standing x-ray. Um, and, and so far, knock on wood, I haven't had any major issues using those, those techniques. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'll have one uh, uh, with time. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, we're at our time, guys. Venu, awesome talk. Um, as as always, this will be posted uh, and recorded, so anybody that didn't get a chance to see it today can always uh, see it, or those of you that wanted to watch it again will have the opportunity to do so. Um, so have a great day, everyone. Uh, have a great weekend, and, and Venu, great talk, man. Really appreciate you. Great. Thanks, Thanks again for having me.